so that when whatever happened happens he has to get the glory because everybody know ain't nothing to the vessel y'all with me so far there is power in the church but it's not in the vessel the excellence said in him. assignment from God is to put into context um, what has happened here uh, the past 10 years but really through all of this church's history but we are focused on these past 10 years and and then point you to the future and so there's a word from the Lord in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to skip around because if I read every, all this in between, I'll be obligated to talk about it and it would take me too long. And so I'm going to read what I need to make the point tonight. Verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And then if you would skip down to verse 5 and I shall read uh, verse 5, verse 6 and 7. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And here's my focal point right here. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And the subject tonight, it's a God thing. It's a God thing. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here tonight to stand and represent you before your people. And so I pray now that you would take my mind, my heart, my words, and just speak through me tonight and be glorified, be honored, be honored in this message and give each of us a heart to receive and an ear to hear. It's a God thing. One of Two, I call it the two-edged swords, and there are many in the church. And two-edged means one side is good, but the other is not. One side of this two-edged sword is very good, and I'm glad God made it that, this way, and it is this. The work of the church is done by God through human agents. There are no angels down here to do the work of the church. And God himself does not come down to do the work of the church. But he engages and he uses human beings. Just think about that for a moment. You and I get the privilege of partnering with God to do his work in the earth. And that's a good thing. And I know in front of me, there are people who have been doing a great work. And I know that even in this pastor, as I listen and I heard and based on what I know, this pastor and his family has been doing a great work over the past 10 years. And I want you to hear me good. The church needs you to be engaged needs you to be involved in this great work. Now that's the good side 
of their sword. But, but here is the other side. Sometimes the human agents who are engaged in the work in partnership with God can get the big head. And then sometimes we get confused. When we get the big head, we get proud about our work. And we start strutting around the church like a little peacock. And when we get confused, we ascribe the responsibility and the outcome of the work to us. In other words, we think that if it were not for us, the work wouldn't get done. I, I know you've not experienced it, but in my uh, ministry, I've had folk threaten to leave the church and say to me, the church wasn't going to make it without them. I know that y'all never heard that, but, but in Georgia, we have people who literally think that they are so important to the work of the church that we can't make it without them. See, see, some, some preachers have to go read stories to tell, but I've been in this long enough to have real stories. I, I, I've even had a man to say to me, you must be a fool. If I had a member who paid as much money as I pay, and he told me he was leaving, I'd be begging him to come back. I said, well, I got a member who pay as much as you pay, but I ain't begging you to come back. In fact, there's the door. You can take it. I'll open it for you. Because your money is not what keep us moving. So, tonight I want to help you know us see it right. I want to help us put this next 10 years in the proper perspective, in the proper place, because if you're sure to do that, the next 10, the next 20 will blow even your mind. Exceedingly abundantly above anything that you can even imagine. The Apostle Paul, the writer of this book, is is talking to the church in this second letter and um, they've been offended by something he said in the first letter and so as he introduces he's he's paving the way if you will reestablishing his credibility and his right as their leader and his authority as an apostle to speak truth and power in their lives and over the church and so he deals in this third and fourth chapter in particular with his ministry. And he says a lot about his ministry, but I, I, I want to pull out uh, that portion that I read to show you that it's a God thing. If you will look at verse 1 again, chapter 4, he said, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. I like the plural there, we. He didn't say, seeing I have this ministry. But he said, seeing we have this ministry. Because ministry is a corporate work. The church rises and falls not just on pastors, not just on a particular group of people, but it rises and falls on we. And so while Paul is the leading, the, the apostle, pastor, if you will, he says, we have this ministry. And listen, listen. He says, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. In other words, we didn't get the ministry because we earned the right to it. But all of us who are engaged in ministry, who have been called to minister, who work in any way in ministry, the only reason we are qualified to work is because of the mercy of God. I, I won't talk about you, but I'll talk about me. I am not qualified to preach this gospel. I hadn't lived good enough. I don't know enough. I don't know enough people who know enough, live good enough. And God didn't choose me because I was good. But his mercy 
his mercy instead of giving me what I deserve, which was being kicked to the curb. God looked past that and gave me the opportunity and gave you the opportunity to be engaged in ministry. And he says, since I got in this ministry, my mind is made up. I'm going to keep on moving. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to get off track. I'm going to keep on keeping on. And then in that next verse that I read, uh, he shows how he is clear about what his calling is and what this ministry is all about. He says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants. So just, just keep that in mind. I am coming back to it. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. And then in verse 5, he talks about the fact that, that God has done something special. After giving us the privilege to preach the gospel, he says in verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's in creation. This same God who did that caused the light to shine in us. This is what Paul is saying. The same God who was there in creation and spoke and light came out of darkness, the same God walked up to dark Paul, to chaotic Paul, saved his soul, put the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ on the inside of him, and now that light shines out through Paul because Jesus put it there. You and I have a light that's been put in us, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was put there by the mercy of God, and not some strange God, but the same God who spoke in the beginning. Now, now, come, come, if you will, and, uh, and look at verse 7. And now, he uses this metaphor. He says to us, uh, but we have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure is the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has been deposited in each one of us. Paul calls it a treasure. Don't miss that. That God took a treasure, the ministry, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the light, and then he, he put it in us. Now, now just, just, just imagine God's best treasure. But then look what he put it in. Look, look at verse 7 and what Paul calls us. He said he has put this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. Paul is talking the language of his day and what he's saying is this. God, like a potter, made a clay jar. A clay jar and took his treasure and put it in a clay jar. Now, now, now this is a glass and some of you got fine china the uh, clay jar didn't measure up to this or right. the wine goblets you got and that fine crystal you got. He didn't put it in that kind of container, but he took a common earthen vessel. He took dirt and molded it in the shape of an earthen vessel, a clay jar. Don't, don't miss what he's trying to say. The earthen vessel made from dust doesn't have much value. The vessel, this earthen vessel that was made, it is fragile. It is marred. It is weak. It hadn't been refined. If you went to the store, it's not what you would buy to drink out of because it is not the best thing on the shelf. It's a simple, poor person's earthen vessel. And he says, but God put his treasure in the earthen vessel. That's him. That's us. Why would God do that? I'm so glad you asked. So that the excellency of the power may be of God 
and not of us. Hold it. You, you didn't get it, so let, let me break it down. God did that so you wouldn't be tripping. So I wouldn't be tripping thinking that we had some power. Power as in authority. Power as in capacity. But God took a weak something and put his treasure in an earthen vessel so that when whatever happen, happens, he has to get the glory because everybody know ain't nothing to the vessel. Y'all with me so far? There is power in the church, but it's not in the vessel. The excellence set is in him. It's in him. If I had time, I, 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 I'd go a little further with that, but, but let, me just, let me just tell you what I want you to take away from that. Look, look, if you will, again, uh, back at verse 5. I told you I was coming back to it. It says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, his servant. And, and, and so when he, when he says to us, this gospel this, this, that we preach and, and that he put it in these vessels that I just described as me and you, so that the excellence that might be of God, so we don't be tripping, he, he, here is... Three things he's trying to say to us, say to us about the way we ought to look at ourselves when we look in the mirror and think about ministry. When we think about your pastor, when you think about me and my brother who pastors and every pastor in here, and when you think about you, especially you church leaders, he said, here is what I want you to take away so that you don't get confused, you don't get a big head, and you don't be tripping because I want to do a great work in my church and I don't want to be hindered by your tripping. So here is takeaway number one. It's not about you. Jacob Chapel and the ministry is not about you. And I say lovingly to, to, to my nephew, it ain't about you. And don't let anybody confuse you and make you think that what has happened here is about you. And everybody else in here, don't you get confused and think that it's about you. Because when you begin to think that this thing is about you, then you start hindering the work and you get in the way. Be, 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 because here is what happened when people have the it's about me syndrome. When we got the it's about me syndrome, you want to be pleased with everything that happened. God is not here to please you. God's vision is not based on whether or not you please with it. When folk, when folk, when folk got the it's about me syndrome, uh, they, they walk around with their feelings on their shoulder. And anytime they feel like they are overlooked, anytime they feel like they are recognized like they ought not, like they ought to be recognized, it's, it's, it's a problem. And anytime they don't get the credit, whether it's pastor or anybody else, for everything that's happened, we start tripping. But it's not about you. Not about old Jermaine, not about you, whatever your name is. I, that person sitting in your seat, pat him on the chest, said, baby, it ain't about you. People, pe pe people, people, people who are caught in that place of it's about me, they create paralysis in the church. And here is how. Since they think it's about them, it has to please them and make them happy, then they try to control. They have these power and control issues. And the church can't move because folk fighting over the power. I got, um, I got a German shepherd, 
big boy. He's, he, he, he's a man. His name is Samson. And my daughter has his brother that came from the same litter. And when she come home, sometimes she's going to stay for a while, she brings her German Shepherd Major. And I just watch them, Samson, try to control the yard. And so what I do is I put two pans of food out, one in one corner and one in the other. And Samson, because he thinks everything is about him in the yard. If Major goes to eat out of one pan, Samson goes, <laughs> So Major bites off and goes to another one. Samson run over, Rawr! And what Samson don't realize, neither one of me. Neither one get fed. Samson can't eat because he's trying to keep Major from eating. And Major can't eat because Samson got him scared. So I just go out there and slap Samson. Let Major eat. Not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And you don't want it to be about you because you can't save anybody. You don't want it to be about you because you can't heal anybody. You don't want it to be about you because this Sunday morning, somebody going to come in here lost and they're going to be looking for some amazing grace and you don't have any amazing grace to give. Somebody going to come in here blind and can't see and they want to receive their sight and you don't have any sight to give. It's in there. Let me, let me tell you what, what else I want you to take away. Not only is it not about you, but the work happens in spite of you. Y'all, you need to come close to this because this is going to blow some of your theology out of the water. I told you it was an earthen vessel. It was marred. It was not perfect. It was cracks and it was weak. It was subject to break through a rock and it just crumbled. Yeah. See, some of us think in this false theology that people have to be perfect to be engaged in ministry at the church. But God doesn't look for perfect people. And if he did, he wouldn't find any. Because Jacob Chapel ain't got none. Mount Zion don't have any. I've been to Abyssinian. Abyssinian don't have any. And this is how God specializes. He takes cracked, broken, fragile, imperfect folk and do great works through them in spite of their frailty, in spite of your hellish ways, in spite of your faults, in spite of your, in spite of your rising and falling. In spite of your sin, in spite, in spite of what your past is, in spite of what Nick, I'm sorry, in spite of what people say, God use you anyway. I wish I had some truth tellers in here. I wish I had some folk who wasn't, wasn't so hot on pretending. See, 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 you know, we, we come to church and we put on. We sit up and we've learned the language and we act like we ain't never sinned, don't know nobody who sinned, but but, 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 but the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in spite of your sin, God use you. Let me, let me tell you something. I, let, let, let me get prophetic. Every person in here that is being used by God, there's some sin in your life. But in spite of that sin, God still use you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk myself out of talking like I'm home. And so, and so, and, 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 and so what you need to do is come to grips with the fact that in spite of your frailty, in spite of your faults, your sin, God will still use you. And so what you got to do is get over the guilt of your past and accept the fact that one, number one, you're a new creature in Christ. And then accept the fact, number two, when you're washed in the blood, he washes all that stuff away. Except, too, that God already knew before he called you what you were going to do and what you were going to be. But in spite of his foreknowledge of you, he called you anyway. 
And so stop sitting down because you feel you ain't worthy because God will use you in spite of. In fact, he chose the earthen vessel, the weak, the broken, so that he would be glorified. And then there's some of us who are hypocrites. Yeah, we, 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 we working and pretending. And I tell you, we get in church and we be acting. And, 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 and we have them condemning spirits. You better just, just keep an eye on folk who are always condemning something, especially what they condemn. You, you, you watch the person who always hopping online. Uh, yeah. Watch him. Watch him. You you got on your two piece now, but behind closed doors you in your dress. Just watch him. I gotta. And and that uh and 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 if this roll down is your alley, don't uh, don't worry about me. I I have a member. I have a male member. Who is gay and we talking? He said, Pastor Simmons, I just, I just hate the hypocrites in church. I said, What, what you mean? He said, now, now see, like me, Pastor Simmons, I'm just out. I, I am what I am. When I come to church, I don't hide it. I'm, I'm, I'm just who I am. But Pastor Simmons, you'd be surprised <laughs> if I start calling names up in here, Mount Zion. I said, Call, call some for me. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't nobody back here but me and you. He said, no, Pastor Simon, call, call you some of them your deacons. And some of them your, mm, that's okay. You, you can still call a name. I don't care if you're a preacher. Call, call it out. And I, and I just named it, but all of us got some little stuff you think you covered. And when he started calling names, I started remembering things. Yeah. What well, these same folk was condemning, yeah. huh, the same thing they were doing. Yeah. At least I tarried too long in spite of my crazy self. God still used me. <laughs> huh. And then, not only... It's not about you. Not only did he use you in spite of you, but God also used you because of you. Yes. Let me just say this real plain. Because you are who you are, Amen. God says, I can use you. Amen. Because when I use you with your frail self, you. you do at least two things for me. Yes. One is you are suited yes. to go out and share your story with folk who are honest enough to admit that they are broken and fragile too. And so you, you, you can go tell them about the goodness of God and what it is that God has done for you. But the second thing, there are some folk you won't talk to, but they know you. And when they witness the change in your life, when they see that you're not perfect, but you're not what you used to be because you've been transformed because of your relationship with me. You become a witness for me, showing again that the excellence is of God and not of the human agents. And I am glorified because of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when, when, when people see us and what God has done for us and through us, God is glorified. They look at us and say, I know if it had not been for God who was on that boy's side, he wouldn't have made, couldn't nobody have done that but God. I 
So God, use you because of who you are. Use me because of me. So that I can, he can be glorified. I have a wonderful, wonderful son in ministry. And this is no secret, so I can, I can say it publicly. And he, he talks about it even in his own preaching. For more than 30 years, he was as bad of a drug addict as you could be. And you name it, he's done it, and, 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 and it's a part of his testimony. He's even written a book about his journey. But one day, after going through all kinds of treatment programs, he said God took it from him. And then God did something unusual. He put his treasure in an earthen vessel that had lost his family, that had lost his job, that has lost his dignity. Yeah. That reputation was tore up from the floor. Yeah. God took him and put the treasure in him. Yeah. And one of the most powerful ministries in North Georgia is his. Yeah. And he has a church that is full of people who were like him. Yeah. And some still like he used to be. Yeah. But he's able to reach them in ways that I never could. Yeah. And God used him. Because of who he is and who he was for a special niche. Uh, well, I'm through preaching now. My uh, brother is here and he's going to come and, and bless y'all real good on Sunday morning. And, um, and so I can go into my seat, but I got two more things to tell you. Now that you understand that um, the past 10 years, all this excellent ministry that has been happening, expansion, more than 25 new ministries, four or 5,000 people added to the church. Uh, this church moving from where it was when he came to where it is now. The power and the influence that he and this church has. Stop by to tell you it's not about him. But it's about a God who, who decided that he would choose him and partner with him and work through him. It's not about you, Jacob Chapel, leaders and members. But it's about a God who chose you and decided to partner with you to work through you. And he did it in spite of you, in spite of your shortcomings. So go ahead and shake off the guilt yeah. and, uh, and just know that God is good yes, in spite of our shortcomings. Yeah. And then know that because of you, God has blessed y'all the way he has yeah. in the past 10 years. Yeah. And folk are looking at you yeah. and they're shaking their head because they can't figure out how y'all did it. Yeah. Because they know that you don't have the power to do it. And that's why you get to tell them that the excellence is of God yeah. and not of you. Yeah. And so what, what I want to tell you now, to make sure you secure the future, uh -huh. use this anniversary uh -huh. to pause yeah. and tell God thank you. Yeah. You, you. You ought not be able to find anybody complaining, but everybody being thankful. Yeah. Thanking God for the partnership. Thanking God for working with you, through you, and on you. Think about people's lives who've been changed. And you ought to be telling God, thank you. And then you ought to look at the partners that you have in ministry that God has put here with you. And you ought to call their name in your prayer life. And you ought to thank God for each one of them. You ought to call your pastor's name, call his wife's name, call JJ's name, and, and thank God for them. For the fact that he used y'all. The way he's been using it. And then after you get through thanking him, you ought to make up your mind that we're going to march on and we're going to march on by faith. Yeah, see, see, I want to challenge you. At the end of your journey, I want you to live and work in such a way that your name will be added to the Hall of Fame. That God will have, if you will, a banquet in heaven. And your name will be added to the Hall of Fame. That's in Hebrews chapter 11. 
And that's where you read that all of these folk walked by faith. And they did all of these miraculous things because they live by faith. And what I want to say to you, your future is limited by your faith. Not God, because God has no limits. But according to your capacity to walk by faith, the same God who used this, these earthen vessels, he's saying if the vessels that got my treasure can meet me on the road to the future and walk by faith, I got something for you. Yeah, he said, I want to put you in the hall of fame. I want to put you with Enoch who walked by faith. So much so that he was translated and didn't see death. Yeah. I want to put you beside Moses, yeah. who by faith uh -huh. delivered the children of Israel from Egypt and Pharaoh. Yeah. I want to put you with Abraham, yeah. who left home by faith, yeah. going to a place that he didn't know, yeah. and trusted me to bless him. Yeah. Trusted me to make he and Sarah fertile in their old age. Yeah. When he was too old and no Viagra to help him, I help him to have a baby because nothing is too hard for God. I want you to join Elijah in his faith who went on top of Mount Calma and conquered Baal and his prophets. Yeah, walked like David by faith who took a slingshot and slew the giant and all of the others who walked by faith. But here is what I want you to remember as you walk by faith. All of these folk who are in the hall of fame they walked by faith, but they were earthen vessels. What do you mean, Pastor? You check their resume. They walked by faith, did great things by faith, but they were all flawed. Moses flawed. That's why he didn't make it in the promised land. Abraham flawed. Lied that his sister, that his wife was his sister. Abraham flawed. Had a baby by Hagar. Sent her away. Low down joker wouldn't pay child support. He was flawed. All that money he had, flawed. Moses, Isaac, all of them, Elijah, flawed. So let me tell you something. Even if you're flawed, you can walk by faith. Even if you're flawed, God will do some stuff to you. Even if you're flawed, God will give you a voice in the community. Even if you're flawed, God will use you to save some dying soul. Even if you're flawed, God will use you to turn Tallahassee upside down. Even if you're flawed, 5,000, 10,000 more souls can come. Even if you're flawed, you can tear this building down and build a brand new building. Even if you're flawed, God will take your places that you can't go. Somebody said, well, Pastor, I can't do that. Then jump out of chapter 11 and jump into chapter 12. He said, and let us now, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let's shake it off. Shake off. Y'all don't mind shaking a little bit, do you? Whatever hinders you, whatever holding you back, go ahead and shake it off. Shake it off. If it's a lying Negro, shake it off. If it's a stubborn member, shake it off. If it's somebody tangling you up, shake it off. And then let's run this race with patience. And how you going to run? Looking unto Jesus. Don't look at your pastor. He's an earthen vessel. Don't look at each other. He's an earthen vessel. But looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm through right now. But it says, but for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame. Let me slow down. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. That means he looked behind the cross and he saw something that gave him joy. And whatever he saw, it was enough to give him what he needed. When they arrested him in the garden, he never said a mumbling word because he saw something beyond the cross when they marched him from judgment hall to judgment hall and no lawyer to plead his case. He never 
said a mumbling word because something on the other side of Calvary gave him joy. They marched him up Calvary's hill. They marched him. He fell to the ground. He got up. They marched him on Calvary's hill. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He died. Do you believe he died? He died till heaven got satisfied. He died for earthen vessels. He died for your shortcomings. He died for my shortcomings. He died for my failures. He died. Died. My daddy said he died until the earth rocked like a drunk man. He died to the S-U-N. Said I can't shine while the S-O-N is hanging on a cross. He died. The moon didn't have tears. So she drifted away in blood. Died. Daddy said he died till the roosters got confused when darkness covered the earth at high noon and began to crow. He died. I said he died. And they buried him in a borrowed grave all night Friday, all day Saturday, but early, early Sunday morning, he got up. I said he got up with all power in his hand because joy before him on the other side of the cross he got up what was that joy it was joy to be back with his father it was joy joy to be exalted in heaven and earth and given a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee gonna bow every tongue gonna confess joy joy to be crowned king of kings and lord of lords joy to get on his robe joy to sit at his seat on the right hand of the father but it was joy joy because he looked through eternity and said oj simmons i got joy I'm going to call you from your mama's womb. I'm going to fix you, mow you, shape you in an earthen vessel. Put you in Tallahassee. Put you at Jacob's Chapel. And through you, I'm going to send you some folk to partner with you. And through you, we're going to do the impossible. I got joy. I see folk being saved. Joy, folk being healed. Joy, joy, hey, joy. Take your neighbor by the hand. Tell him this for me, if you don't mind. Do a, do a neighbor check. Say you don't mind if I hold your hand and talk to you. Do you? Tell them that, tell them this, I was part of the joy on the other side of the cross. Because when I got saved, heaven rejoiced. Because there's more joy in heaven over one who was lost but now found than it is 99 saved one. And I'm one that was lost. So here's what I want to say. When you got saved, Jesus saw the joy. And it was one Friday, one Friday morning, when I got saved, he saw me coming up out of the muck and the mire. He saw me being saved from my sin. He saw me being washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
Can I pause right here for a personal break? Thank you. Thank you for hanging on the cross. Thank you for hanging in there so I could be saved. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you.